We're so grateful. Ladies, um, again, my name is Sherelle Warren. I'm your teaching leader for this class, and I'm so happy to have you all here with me. I do have one announcement for you, and that announcement is about contributions. Our contribution plates are actually located. Uh, there's normally going to be one here. Amen. Thank you, Nancy. And there's one out there in the atrium, and then there's also one in the foyer. I love it. Donna's doing the airline attendant. The, yeah, it's like, all right, thank you, Lord. So feel free to uh, give to BSF if you like. Amen. All right, ladies, the outline will be up for a few minutes. Praise the Lord. Kathleen, you're doing wonderful. Mom, such a great support back there. Amen. All righty. So I will start the lecture since Pastor Greg prayed for us, ladies, okay? So I, again, I'm always thinking about how am I going to open us up for this lecture? You know, what is it that God wants me to say? And so in this opening, I uh, begin to think about how when parents at the end of their lives they have uh, made investments, they have money that they would like to leave to their children. And uh, many times they have intended for this to bring ease and comfort to their, their families, you know, so that they don't have to figure out who gets what or someone doesn't have to figure it out for them. Well, even in that most proper planning, there will still the division within the children about who got this, who got that, who got more, who got less, whatever the case may be. And in fact, sometimes it's the greed of the children that are leading, you know, that motive to want more and to feel that they need more. And it does cause division within the family, even though that wasn't the intent for the parents. So, we know that we should store up our treasures where? In heaven. Amen. Amen. And so um, one of the things that we know is that proper planning does take what? Wisdom, right? So when parents do that, they have a, a plan. They're trying to be wise in their planning, right? And to keep most of that confusion, what? At bay. But when the children focus on the money and greed and their own self-gratification, even the most wisest parents cannot help them, even though they were purposeful in their planning. So when we start out, we have in Kings, we have the United Kingdom, right? And what happens when we don't care about what anybody else thinks, right? We're left to our own destruction. Have you ever said, I don't care what anybody else says? Hmm, right. Well, let's take a look here at Solomon. Solomon was the wisest king, right, and in, in, in the history of Israel. But his many foreign wives, and I know y'all know the numbers of these foreign wives and concubines, right, mm -hmm. introduced him to what? False gods and false worship into Israel. So, to have wisdom is good, but it's not enough. Don't we know that? The highest goal in life is to obey God, be obedient to God. That is what we should be doing in our lives as Christ followers. So, in the reign of Solomon, as we look at 1 Kings, the purpose here is to contrast the lives of those who lived for God and those who refused to do so. So through the history of kings of Israel and Judah, if we really pay attention, we can also see the same similarities in our lives today. However, the original audience was what? The people of what? Israel. That's right. Amen. So the books of kings are, were originally one book, if you didn't know that. So to set the scene, the great nation of Israel turned into a land divided not only physically but also spiritually. Although Solomon was granted enormous privilege and wisdom in his final years, 
They were evidence of the moral and spiritual decline as well as civil decline. Do we not see that today? Solomon found disobedience more alluring than the divine instruction of God. And sadly, it laid the foundation to break up the kingdom. In our culture, we have moved away from the morals and values of God. It isn't uncommon that we find people that we think we share the same morals and values and you're left finding out that absolutely not. We don't share the same morals and values. So most people today are interested in what makes them what feel good, right? This can be a reminder to us today that human nature can push us to reject God's wisdom and to do our own thing. You know this new saying, my truth? It in my truth is God's truth. So please note that the main event of 1 Kings is David's death, Solomon's reign, and the division of the kingdom. As Solomon ascended to the throne, David told him what? He says, obey God's laws, right? And follow his ways. Look it up. It says, so what are we passing down to our children and our grandchildren? Are we telling them to obey God's laws and follow God's ways? So Solomon took on many pagan wives, as I mentioned, and concubines, and I know y'all know the numbers, right? Who eventually turned his heart away from the Lord and to their false gods. So as believers, and especially the month of October that's coming up, be careful what you're celebrating. Are you celebrating things that pagan, pagan beliefs, practices that are wicked and evil? And what I hope we learn today is that rejecting God and choosing sin brings bitter consequences. Rejecting God and choosing sin brings bitter consequences. Although Solomon had clear instructions from God to not marry women from foreign nations, he chose to disregard God's commands. So we have two divisions today. Our first division is after Solomon, Israel divided into two kingdoms under Rehoboam and Jeroboam. And our second division is Jeroboam led Israel into idolatry and disaster while Rehoboam tolerated idols. Now, let's take a look at what's going on here with Solomon. Okay, so these are, I'm going to identify the spiritual failures for you, so I want you to be able to see these, okay? He married not one, but many foreign women who subsequently led him away from God. God knows our strengths and our weaknesses, and his commands are always good. When people ignore God's commands, negative consequences inevitably result. It's not enough to know God's word or even to believe it. We must follow and apply it to the way we live and to our decisions. Here's a warning, ladies. Take God's commands seriously and make your closest friends those who are also striving to follow God. Like Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, we are not as strong as we may think. I don't want to appear strong by perfecting things in front of y'all, even the pronunciation of names. All right? Submitting to God's commands to do what he asked of me to do it for, is for his purpose. And it releases me to, from thinking that I know best, right? Okay? So I can let him use me, all right, so that I may be seen weak so that he is strong and glorified. Amen. I want people around me who understand the Lord's will and are submitted to his purposes to not get caught up in the superficial things, right? But to get caught up in Jesus. And I've been blessed to have a team here with my BSF sisters who believe in the Lord and are walking in his ways. To God be the glory. So let's look at some evidence. Solomon couldn't handle the pressures from his wives who wanted him to worship their gods. 
In marriage and close friendships, it is difficult to resist the pressures to what? Compromise, right? We see it in our children. We even see it in ourselves. When we don't influence others with the word of God, they can influence us. Our love leads us to want to what? Identify, right? Those you love with, you want to identify with them because you care about them, right? So faced with this pressure, Solomon tried to resist it and to stay in faith. Then he began to tolerate more widespread practices of idolatry. He became involved in idol worship himself and didn't see the potential dangers to himself or to the kingdom. And this is what happens to our homes. When we start to tolerate sinful and evil things, it affects our families and it affects our house. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. This is the potential warning for us. Those who do not share the same commitment to God, be careful, okay? Be careful who you release your children and your grandchildren to. When they're at school and they're involved in these sports activities and all of these activities and they're involved in these programs at school, be careful about just releasing your children to these beliefs and practices. Prepare them in God's ways and God's instruction to help them fight against wicked and evil things. All right, amen. Warning, when we allow sin to become a lifestyle, it doesn't just stay in one part of our life. It begins to permeate, bless you, all aspects of our life. Over time, sin will keep us and turn us away from God. It's not the sin we don't know about, but the sin we excuse that causes the greatest trouble. We must never let sin go unchallenged in our life. It can spread like a wildfire. Remember, we need to repent, don't excuse it, confess sin to God and ask him for the strength to resist temptation. Our doctrine today is on sin. God's people and their kings did not seek God wholeheartedly. Their history and choices reveal the sin nature common to all mankind. The downward spiral of the nation that will lead to a divided kingdom reveals the destruction caused, caused by sin. Sin is a broad term, right, that describes the, any offense against God's absolute holiness and the lack of conformity to his will. Sin entered the world through Adam and Eve, and since every human has been born with a sinful nature, sin corrupts our thoughts, it corrupts our motives, our actions of humankind. The damage inflicted by sin is very evident in our world and within ourselves. People who don't naturally seek, people don't naturally seek God, right? We resist him. We love ourselves and our agendas more than God and his ways. So our focus verse from this week's lesson is if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. That's 1 John 1, 8 through 9. Our sin subjects us to God's wrath, bringing eternal consequences in Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Come to the Father today. The bad news about sin elevates the good news of the gospel. God's grace towards sinners is greater than our sin. If when we do not believe in the pervasiveness of sin, I cannot explain the brokenness evident and myself, humanity, and the world. If I believe that people are born basically good, I do not recognize the seriousness of sin or the need of salvation. Hmm. When I believe sin has infected me 
and the rest of humanity, I run to Jesus for salvation. Only he can restore what sin has destroyed. The amazing gift of salvation in Christ grows in beauty and significance. The reality of sins, corporate and individual damage, explains the brokenness that we experience in this world. Do you ever shake at the stronghold of sin in the world, even in our own hearts? The offense of our sin ultimately against God, only he can solve this sin problem. Spiritual growth requires an ongoing battle with sin only through the power of the Holy Spirit. Believers continue to battle with their sin nature, but have been given the power to overcome sin. Spiritual growth, sanctification involves recognizing, confessing, and turning from specific sin. Our battle with sin can be discouraging, but the tension is evident that God is in, at work in us. Have you experienced this? All right. So ladies, I'm going to move us down to our first principle, all right? And it says, our first principle is sin causes damage and leads to division. The only hope we have is in Jesus. He is the one that God sent to deal with all those words, deeds, and desires that oppose him. But that does not mean that there are not consequences to sin. Since sin is anything that opposes God, that makes sin dangerous, destructive, pain-inducing, damaging, and toxic. And not only that, but it is universal. None of us are untouched by sin. It is everywhere, right? And so are the consequences, which amplify the incredible love of God for those who choose to come to him. From the beginning, our all-knowing God had a plan to save us, a plan to redeem. So although sin's consequences are real, so are the redemptive purposes of God. So let's look at the judgment of the Lord. The cause of God's anger and the tragedy of Solomon's disobedience is highlighted by the fact that God had appeared to him, what, twice in dreams. The Lord revealed himself to Solomon one more time, bringing a message of judgment. For his rejection of God, Solomon would have his kingdom torn away and given to another. It would crumble. Solomon's son would retain a portion of the kingdom, one tribe, but Solomon's servant would claim the rest. While God wouldn't let the kingdom split occur until Solomon's son was in power and would still grant him the throne. He did this not because Solomon deserved it, all right? But he did it for the sake of David and for the sake of Jerusalem. And this wasn't the only consequence. So. The sovereign God of the universe raised up enemy for him. Hadad, an Edomite, and Razan, who was trouble for Solomon for the rest of his life, okay? So they, they came, one came from the north, one came from the south, right? So Solomon was like, what? He was sandwiched in between <laughs> these two enemies. Mm, Lord, God had allowed that. Sovereign is one of God's attributes from this week. This was in God's sovereignty. And then we have Jeroboam. He's introduced. He rebelled, and he was one of Solomon's actual officials, right? Because he was Solomon's, what, servant. And he was in charge of the entire labor, fo labor force for uh, the tribe of Joseph. So, but one day, so Jeroboam is out for a walk and he comes across a prophet Ahijah and it's just the two of them and Ahijah takes his brand new cloak he's wearing and he tears it into 12 pieces and he gives 10 to 
Jeroboam, and he speaks of the, on the Lord's behalf. He says, take 10 pieces for yourself, for this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. See, I am going to tear the kingdom out of Solomon's hand and give it to you. I'm going to give you 10 tribes. But for the sake of my servant David in the city of Jerusalem, remember, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, he will have one tribe. All right? And the prophet goes on to say why the Lord was doing this. And it's because what? They had forsaken him and worshipped those little g-gods and goddesses. It was out of, it was where their heart was, was the issue, right? The prophet proceeded to tell Jeroboam that he will rule and that if he chooses to do what God commands and walk in obedience to him, that God will be with him and he will build him a dynasty. Did you, don't miss that. All right? So think about in your own life some of the promises that God has given you. Solomon's reaction is to try to kill Jeroboam, but he's unsuccessful, and Jeroboam takes off to Egypt and stays there until after Solomon dies. And so then Solomon reigns for 40 years, and his son Rehoboam succeeds him. So after Solomon died, his son, King Rehoboam, ruled the Israelite people with cruelty. Israel rebelled and made Jeroboam king over the ten tribes, just as Ahijah had prophesied. Rehoboam continued to rule the remaining tribes of Judah and Benjamin, known as the southern kingdom of Judah. All right, so our second division is Jeroboam led Israel to idolatry and disaster while Rehoboam tolerated idols. We'll see the divided kingdoms. So after Solomon's death, the northern tribes revolted, okay, and they formed two separate nations. Each nation ex experienced dangerous consequences from having these evil kings. So let's look at what happens in chapter 12, also described in 2 Chronicles 10. So there's a gathering at Shechem for Rehoboam to be what made king, right? And Jehoram returns from Egypt, which, which there's a lot of history in that city. And so Jehoram is part of this group of Israelites gathered, and they ask for what? A lightened lighten labor under his rule, and they prom if, and then they promise to serve him. So Rehoboam checks with the elders, Okay, which they provide what? Good advice. They provide counsel. But there's a harshness there. And there's a history there. And Rehoboam goes with the advice of his friends. My, my, my. And he decides to make the labor even more harsh. Have you ever gone around looking for the advice that you want to hear? All right. Mm. He doesn't look at the heart or think about the people, or he doesn't even have a heart for the people. There's the tension building, and the vision is on the rise. So Rehoboam did not listen to the elders or the people, and this only fulfilled the prophecy that Ahijah spoke when he spoke God's word to Jeroboam. Rehoboam chose his way, making a big mistake, right, out of a heart and heart that caused division. When we choose our own way, it is always a big mistake. We're going to look at the last part of 1 Kings, that's chapter 13 and 14, where we see disobedience increasing. It's really a stubborn heart, right, that we're looking at in 1 Kings 13, chapter 13. It seems that these hearts that we are seeing are 
deepening in sin, and so are the consequences. So in chapter 13, and the stubborn heart is only more on display here. In short, what happens is that we have this man from Judah. There's no name given for the man, thank God. But a man comes to Bethel and meets with Jeroboam, and he's going about, as he's going about his business, on sacrificing the idols, right? I've alluded to this. And he cries out in the prophecy regarding Josiah being born, which would be fulfilled about, what, 340 years, right? So there's also an announcement of judgment, rebuking Jeroboam, and even including signs that would take place to confirm this prophecy. And Jeroboam, in what seems to be a most clear, deliberate disobedience, stretches out his hand, right, toward the man and yells back, arrest him. I don't know, but was this a way of him rejecting God? Because God was speaking through this man? If we don't believe in the realities of sin, we can't explain these things. We stretch out our hands, and we're in continual shock at what we see. And we also don't run to Jesus, which is the solution. And he can be the problem solver. So Jeroboam stretches out his hand towards the man of God as he shouted, But in horror, the, his hand shrivels up, right? And not only that, but then the sign the man had spoke comes to fruition right before his eyes. The altar splits apart, ashes are poured out, and now scripture tells us that Jeroboam pleaded for intercession here, which the man graciously does. In his mercy, God heals Jeroboam's hand. But I, did Jeroboam mean it? Mm. Okay, so in verse 6, it says, he says, intercede with the Lord your God and pray for me. There's a big difference here between waiting on wanting something from God and what? True repentance, right? We can't pick God up when we want, put him down when we want. It doesn't work like that. Our second principle. Sin's destruction escalates when God's grace is refused. So there's a big difference between asking something of God and calling him our Lord. And so the stubbornness of his heart becomes even more evident near the end of, chap of the chapter um, in, verse, in verse 33, okay? When it says, even after this, Jeroboam did not change his evil ways. He's sticking by his choices, and these choices are painful, have painful consequences. So in chapter 14 of 1 Kings, we see Jeroboam, as he abandoned the Lord God of Israel— his son gets sick, and he's in need of help, right? So he tells his wife to disguise herself and to go see who? Ahijah, that's right, the man of God, right? Mm. There's some good stuff there. Maybe he knew that these idols could do nothing for him, right? We see that in our world today when things are terrible then People acknowledge God and want to come to him, right? But he also knew that he had rejected God and his prophets, right? And so then Ahijah, who is not led astray by this disguise of Jeroboam's wife, she's hit with the hard truth that what? Her son is going to what? Die, right? So... In 1 Kings, we see in uh, chapter 14, verses 12 through 18, I, just for the sake of time, ladies, I'm not going to read those verses to you, but just go back and look that up for yourself. Take a moment and insert that reading into this part of the lecture, okay? So, and lastly, we have seen 
before as the consequences of sin that they are misled hearts. People are led into sin by poor leadership because that's what's going on here. And so these final verses of 1 King 14 describe the scenario. As we switch back to Rehoboam, it is said that in verse 22 that Judah did evil in the eyes of the Lord. By the sins they committed, they stirred up his jealous anger more than those who were before him. These kings got wick they were more wicked and more wicked. We don't want to be like them, right? We want to go and come to Jesus. So we can't save ourselves, right? And we can't change our own hearts. It is a divine work that we cannot do. When we choose to give our hearts away to things or people other than God, when we choose the divided heart, the consequences are painful because it's not how we were designed, right? We talked about how we were designed last week. We are designed to worship God only and be in relationship with him. And when we don't live how we are designed to live, it's like gasping for air. It's hard to stay afloat. We're going to struggle. We're going to suffer consequences. So if you read in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, right? But right before that, in 2 Chronicles 6, Solomon asked God to make provisions for the people, his people of Israel, when they sinned. God answered him in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, with four conditions for forgiveness. I think it's important that we are reminded of these, okay? God's people should what? Humble themselves by admitting their sins. Two, pray, ask for forgiveness. Three, seek God continually. And four, turn from sinful behavior. Remember, true repentance means more than just talk. It requires us to change our attitudes and our behaviors. Whenever we sin individually, as a group, or as a nation, following these steps lead to forgiveness. God will answer our earnest prayers. God is totally waiting for us. His, the grace of God can do the transforming work in us. So although sin consequences are real, so are the redemptive purposes of God. Come to the Father today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord. We thank you for the revelation of your word. We can add nothing to what you have already done. We are so grateful. May you use us. May we bring light in dark places. May we not be contaminated by the world and the culture around us, but may we bring your influences to this world and to this culture. May Christians not stand on the outskirts, but may we rise up in the name of Jesus and speak your words. Thank you, Lord, for giving us the word of God. May we be submitted to your will and submitted to your authority, your sovereignty. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.